Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the fourth and final day of the 11th Annual Canadian Restaurant Investment and Leadership Summit. Once again, my name is Dimitri Mazur. I am with CRB Franchise Finance, your host for this summit, and I will be your virtual MC for today. Uh, we do have two, two sessions on the agenda today. Uh, the first is the Ghost Kitchens and Virtual Concepts panel, uh, which you are in right now. Uh, and following this session at 2 p.m. Eastern is the Innovations in Restaurant Development panel discussion. Uh, I'd like to go through a couple uh, brief housekeeping items, uh, so please do bear with me. Uh, so we have 45 minutes booked for today's Ghost Kitchens and Virtual Concepts panel discussion, and you'll have the opportunity to submit questions throughout today's presentation uh, by typing your questions into the Q&A area on the right-hand side of your screen. Uh, we will try to address all of them at the end of the discussion. Uh, if we don't get to all of them, we will follow up with you directly uh, afterwards. Uh, all sessions are being recorded and uploaded in the platform for on-demand viewing. Uh, if you missed a session earlier this week, uh, you can visit the sessions tab and watch the replay at your convenience. Uh, we will keep access to the platform open for the next, uh, the next couple weeks uh, for your viewing. And we will also be posting uh, the videos publicly next week and we'll share the links uh, via an email. For those who haven't joined us before, we will also be sending out an email later this afternoon with a link to download a copy of our 2021 Canadian Chain Restaurant Industry Review, along with a link uh, to provide your feedback on uh, today's sessions. Before we get started, I do want to take a moment again to thank our sponsors. Uh, without their support, uh, we simply would not be able to put this summit on. So our platinum sponsors, Chicken Farmers of Canada and Cisco, our gold sponsors, Seven Shifts, Attitude Marketing, Castles, Garland Canada, and Uber Eats. Our silver sponsors, Coca-Cola, Dairy Farmers of Canada, Interact, and Sotos. And our bronze sponsors, Food Buy, J. Ross Hospitality Recruiters, Kitchen Partners, Measure Up, Osler Dash, Smooth Commerce, SBLR, Weeks Construction Group, and XTM Inc. Uh, also, we all also want to thank uh, Menu Magazine and Restaurants Canada for being our media partner and the NPD Group. Uh, our premier research sponsor, as well as FS Strategy for their contribution uh, to the 2021 Canadian Chain Restaurant Review. And now let's get to today's discussion. Let's dive right in. Uh, the Ghost Kitchens and Virtual Concepts panel. Um, as the industry continues to uh, evolve and innovate, uh, one thing's for sure is the Ghost Kitchen and Virtual Restaurant model is here to stay. Uh, so joining us today is a group of experienced restaurant operators and industry experts. Uh, who will be discussing how to build success uh, and sustainable growth, uh, growth through this segment, uh, not only now, but in the future as well. So a big thank you to this session sponsor, Uber Eats. And I'm now going to pass it over to today's moderator, Jim Dover from FS Strategy, to introduce today's panelists and lead the discussion. Over to you, Jeff, and welcome, everybody. Thanks, Dimitri. It is uh, my pleasure to moderate today's panel. Today, we're going to take an in-depth look at what ghost kitchens are and how they work. Uh, the term ghost kitchen uh, can mean a variety of things to a variety of different types of businesses. We will discuss the business models, how they work, how technology is incorporated, and what the, the future holds. So with me today, we have uh, Lola Kasim. She's the general manager of Uber Eats Canada, responsible for the country company's operations, strategy, and growth in the country. Previously, she held the role of general manager for Uber in, the West, in West Africa. Lola has over 14 years of international experience working across the private and public sectors in Canada and Africa across operations, strategy, development, and policy. Prior to joining Uber, Lola was an engagement manager with McKinsey and Company, where she led the teams in energy, public, and financial service sector in West and Southern Africa. Uh, Himat Begwani is an entrepreneur, a chef, and sommelier who studied in Switzerland and Austria before arriving in Canada. Since 19, or since 2002, Himat has opened 53 restaurants in Ontario. Uh, this includes the Amaya Group of Restaurants, the Good Karma Restaurants, Go Indian Farm Kitchen, uh, just to name a few. He has a catering division, a commissary kitchen, a gourmet division that approve, that produces Amaya, uh, or sorry, Amaya non breads and sauces in grocery stores across the country. Um, he mentors chefs, cooks, service staff alike, and he was a finalist for the Ernst and Young Entrepreneur Award in 2015. Um, and uh, last but not least, George Cottas is the uh, founder of Ghost Kitchen Brands, um, so an appropriate person to have on this panel today. 
He has worked at and in restaurants, built and run franchises in Canada and globally, and launched many food brands. George has served in corporate roles, but at heart, he is a serial entrepreneur. Uh, Ghost Kitchen Brands is a kitchen optimized for multiple brands. He's going to talk about that today in the panel. Uh, the kitchen is elevated by technology for both online delivery and takeout. So thank you for uh, joining us today. And we look forward to um, you sharing your knowledge on, uh, on in this category. And I will start with you, Lola. Um, we've all heard a lot about ghost kitchens. However, this term means different things to different people. Will you please describe um, the different types of ghost kitchens? Sure. So thanks, Jeff. Uh, and, you know, pleasure to, to be here virtually with everyone today. Um, so yeah, I think the first question is a really great one because there are a lot of different terms uh, used in this space to describe, I think, what are really a lot of different, uh, a lot of different models. Um, I like to think about this space in terms of almost two broad buckets. Um, the first being what you could refer to as like a virtual restaurant or a virtual kitchen. Um, and here, typically, you're looking at like a brick and mortar or an existing restaurant that, you know, people know and love. Um, and that restaurant, you know, takes the decision, hey, let's create a kind of new or virtual brand out of this existing location that's typically for delivery or takeout only. So one, you know, kind of like big name a lot of people know, of course, Pizza Pizza, brick and mortar locations that people know. But they also have a virtual brand that's chicken chicken. So you wouldn't go in to eat in a chicken chicken store. But if you look on some delivery platforms, you will be able to order chicken chicken. And that's essentially using the ingredients, the staff, um, the, the resources that are already located in that brick and mortar store. Uh, and under this kind of, you know, virtual restaurant uh, umbrella, uh, you've got, you know, concepts that are created, generated by the existing uh, restaurant. But you've also got some companies that specialize in creating brands, creating food concepts that are then licensed out to anyone who's got a kitchen and the, you know, the preparation, the folks who want to then, you know, create and produce this delivery only brand. So I'd say kind of that virtual restaurant, virtual kitchen is like one big, um, uh, one big grouping. Um, another grouping I'd say is essentially, you know, what you could call the ghost kitchen, dark kitchen, kitchen collection, kitchen collective. You know, there are various, uh, you know, various names for these kind of spaces. And again, various models. So, and I know we're, we're going to hear more from George and Hamad about this. But here you're typically looking at, at um, a place that isn't a restaurant where you would go to dine in, right? So this is a location that's really about preparing food. Um, this can be the model where you've got someone like, for example, a cloud kitchen where you know, essentially they're leasing out space to people who want to produce food for their own brands. You've got other models that are much more vertically integrated. So the person who owns the space has owned or licensed the brands, has the employees, etc., uh, and then are essentially, you know, creating, uh, you know, you know, creating food for, for folks. I'd say what's common typically, you know, whether you're looking at virtual kitchen, virtual restaurants, or the ghost kitchen, dark kitchen element, is that these tend to be delivery only or takeout only type of concepts, which is why, of course, you know, they're booming and gaining much more, I think, uh, you know, notoriety or, or interest over the past couple of years during the pandemic when things have really started uh, to shift and grow in terms of the delivery space. So hope that helps give a, a sense of the, the overall landscape. Okay. Um, Himant or George, did you have anything to add there? No, she did a great job. Yeah. She did, for sure. Well, George, uh, maybe if you could start us off on how the economics of different types of ghost kitchens work. What are people who are interested in operating ghost kitchens need to know from a financial perspective? Well, uh, I, again, it, it goes back to the different types of models that are out there, right? Uh, so my ghost kitchen is completely different than the majority because we own and operate all our kitchens. and. The industry keeps adapting and changing as we go. So when I started, we had, you know, I used to take the worst location in the city with the cheapest rent and just run virtual brands. Then we've adapted to uh, nothing but national brands. So all my kitchens now have nothing but national brands and no virtual brands. And now we're pivoting again, uh, to touch on what Lola said, and we're actually doing dining because we've essentially created a food court. So we have 20 brands, national brands in one location. So people are flocking to the stores now because we have that many options as a virtual food court and an actual food court. 
Um, so for us, it's a little bit different because we only operate all the brands, so all the revenues come in to, to one specific company. Uh, virtual brands, you got to be careful, right? Um, it, it, it's it's a trend right now. Uh, there's a lot of people out there doing them. Uh, a lot of new brands popping up. A lot of celebrities getting involved, which is great. Uh, it helps get the brands off the ground. Uh, just you know, the operations. That's my only concern. Uh, operations, operations, operations. When you when you have three, four, five, six brands, it starts to affect your brick and mortar. It starts to affect your your, your overall execution of all the product and the quality. Uh, but it's a great resource. It's a, you know, during COVID, I'm, I'm sure it saved a lot of restaurant. So a lot of people in the hospitality industry by adding a few virtual brands while all the dining rooms closed. Okay, thanks. Um, Iman, did you have anything to add to that? No. How, how about um, maybe if you could uh, let us know how uh, ghost kitchens could be streamlined, uh, how they could be operated more efficiently than they are today? Oh, I think you might be on mute, Iman. I, I love this question. Um, I, I, I think ghost kitchens, it's a silver lining in our business right now. Um, it's uh, last two years, I've, I've had a few locations, for example, that survived because of ghost kitchens. But the way George is doing, you know, I've seen from the very first year to now, it's been changing. The, the model has been changing, but it's not an easy, uh, easy thing to do. Uh, probably Lola will agree. A lot of people who are doing it are failing because they have no idea how to control their costs there. You know, food, to keep food, uh, a menu simple is, is the key here. You have to be in a, in a high demand area. You know, you cannot be just somewhere and, 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 and make a successful ghost kitchen there. Um, technology plays a very, very important part there in streamlining those kitchens. If you don't have the right technology, it's very tough. You know, I've, I've seen how Ghost Kitchen Brands has been doing it, for collaborating with a brand like Notch and others to, you know, they're getting support by the other brands and they're supporting, you know, vice versa. But I do think uh, when you when you look into streamlining, uh, streamlining the Ghost Brands, you really, really need to know what brands you're going to pick, how simple the menu you're going to make uh, and, and how fast you can execute it. Most people fail in the execution part here. So you really, really have to get into the technology with this because the only thing there is, is the online present, the online traffic out there. So you have to have the right uh, digital platform to help you out there. Okay, thank you. Well, Lola, um, we all know that delivery was growing significantly before the pandemic, and certainly it was a significant service model during the pandemic, which I'm really hoping is uh, we're seeing the end of. Um, now that the worst of the pandemic anyway is behind us, what are the trends that we can expect in delivery? Uh, another great uh, question, Jeff. So um, I'd say yes, I think we're all super happy that the worst of the pandemic um, seems to be behind us. Um, but I think, you know, from my perspective, one thing's pretty clear, which is that, you know, food delivery and delivery of a lot of things beyond just restaurant food is here to stay. Um, I think folks' habits and kind of, you know, you know, general consumer trends have just shifted, right? You know, I personally, for one, I was not somebody who ordered takeout a lot before the pandemic, getting sick of it after a while, even though I work at Uber Eats. But I know for sure um, that, you know, in the next year, two years plus, I'm going to be ordering more takeout than I did prior to the pandemic, simply because it's just become so easy, right? Um, we've got, you know, a multitude of restaurants, right? Um, multitude of apps, depending on what you're looking for. And it's just become so easy and convenient to get exactly what you want in a quick amount of time at the quality you want, right? So I think that's here to stay. Um, but I do think there are some shifts that have really been, you know, uh, cemented a, a bit more during the pandemic. And I think one of them is that people expect more, right? So people are expecting more than just, you know, maybe, you know, the typical things we maybe ordered for delivery, you know, 10, 15 years ago, pizza, Chinese food, Italian, etc. People want to be able to get everything, you know, whether it's, you know, a salad or Ethiopian food. People are expecting that that whole plethora of what they've got in their diverse cities in Canada is going to be available to them. So I think that's one. Um, and I think there's more of 
an expectation in terms of you know what you can get beyond food, right? Um, grocery, for example, there are tens, thousands of Canadians who are now getting used to ordering their groceries online, and that's something that simply wasn't the case um, uh, before the pandemic. Um, folks are expecting things like alcohol, um, right? So not just food, uh, be, being able to order a bottle of wine or you know a can of beer, that kind of thing. That's really taken off. Um, you're also seeing convenience. Um, so folks wanting to be able to order from 7-Eleven, maybe at midnight, who knows, you know, you've got, you know, a craving for something. Um, and I'd say another interesting trend when you look at, again, beyond food is things like prescriptions, right? We at Uber Eats recently launched a partnership with Repsol. You can get your prescription filled and order some toilet paper and some candy bars, et cetera, et cetera. So I think there's just this expectation um, uh, of more. Um, and I also think folks are starting to think about this as, you know, a bit more part of their everyday lives. Um, and so are willing to invest in things like, for example, like memberships. So like we've got something called Uber Pass, so you, know, you pay a membership fee, your delivery is free, right? Kind of like an Amazon Prime type thing. Um, but again, I think folks are just saying, this is something I'm not just going to do once or twice a year. I'm going to do it on an ongoing basis. And so want to make sure that, you know, the, the services that I use are convenient um, and, you know, um, you know, the, 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 the economics makes sense. And so memberships in this space um, are, are starting to take off uh, as well. Great. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go right back to you, Lola, and ask uh, what, uh, and then I'm going to, I would like to hear from Heman and George on this one as well. Um, but what are the best practices for marketing ghost kitchen? Ooh, okay. Um, yeah, I can. I can. I'm happy to happy to kick this. I, I love you. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, I mean, mark, uh, mar You know, uh, marketing is is huge, right? Because you know these, you know, for, to an extent, are often new concepts. They can be essentially new brands. It can be old brands, but a bunch of brands now, you know, under a specific name, whether it's, you know, Ghost Kitchens or, you know, um, Kitchen Hub, et cetera. So folks need to be able to find that. Um, and I think the exciting thing about apps like Uber Eats is that at the end of the day, yes, they're about, you know, connecting, you know, an eater to a restaurant to somebody to deliver it. But honestly, the part of the, you know, a huge part of the value we provide is marketing and allowing people to find your restaurant or your brand, whether it's a dark kitchen, a virtual brand, or even a conventional restaurant. Um, you know, I think, um, you know, it's something like 65% of people who, you know, come on these apps, they actually don't know what they want to eat when they open up the app, right? So you want to put yourself in a space where, you know, if you're an owner or an operator, eaters are choosing you. Um, so what are the kind of things you can do? I mean, there's there, there's all sorts of um, all sorts of things, but a couple um, which we uh, tend to work with our restaurant partners on quite a bit um, are what we call in-app promotions. So, for example, hey, are you going to offer a BOGO, a buy one get one, right? Um, are you going to offer a free item? So you know, you order this, you get a free item, or or discounts. And restaurants can do these at any time. But we also try and create a little buzz and a little bit of energy around this. So, you know, once a month, you know, we'll say, hey, you know, thousands of restaurants in Toronto on the platform, this week is the BOGO week, right? And if you subscribe to that campaign, that's a, a nice and a fun way to get uh, greater visibility. Um, a few other things I've mentioned are um, sponsored listings. And sponsored listings are essentially an ad, right? So, you know, paying to, you know, get better placement in a feed, in our feed, um, so that you're top of mind for eaters. Um, and we've seen that the return on investment in this kind of um, uh, advertisement has actually been really, really high um, for our restaurant partners, which is really exciting. Um, and then I'd say beyond that, things like social media, huge. Um, and, you know, we've taken the step a couple months ago of actually making it possible for merchants to, like, actually just integrate their Instagram story into the Uber app, into the Uber Eats app, right? So, you know, of course, we know these days social media is huge, but for folks to be able to see that content that you're creating, that you're generating, um, and trying to share with the broader public, to be able to see that in the app we found has been uh, something uh, that's been quite helpful to restaurant partners as well. But yeah, marketing is huge. <laughs> uh, and at the end of the day, you know, being top of mind and being able to share your story and what you're doing with the consumer is, is, is a big part of being able to succeed in this virtual restaurant and ghost kitchen space. 
Thank you. That was really interesting. Uh, Himant or George, do you have anything to add on marketing of ghost kitchens? Oh, definitely. Uh, if people ask me what my biggest challenge has been in the six years that I've been in the space now, and it's probably marketing, uh, educating consumers on what a ghost kitchen is. Um, you know, uh, up to about a year ago, we had all our brands on Uber, so we'd have Cinnabon, Quiznos, Amaya, all independently. But we finally uh, put it all together under one brand, Ghost. And over the last few months, we've seen that Ghost Kitchens is, uh, they're still independent. All the brands are still independent on the Uber. But Ghost Kitchens has taken off and has become our number one brand. Where you can actually order from Amaya and Quiznos and Ben and & Jerry's and uh, Cinnabon and Cheesecake and so on and only pay for delivery. So marketing for us is the number one thing on our agenda is to educate customers that they can go on those kitchens and be able to you know, pick from 20 different restaurants instead of one and only pay one delivery fee. So essentially it's giving a unique you know, opportunity for consumers to be able to pick from 20 different menus instead of just one. I think also um, everyone has to realize they're not putting uh, bricks and mortars, right? So you need to spend more money on marketing. It's very important. Uh, you know, people get into, um, and I'll, I'll take side of Uber there uh, with Lola. Uh, you know, they get into shamming that, oh, Uber is making too much money. They're taking it away. But, you know, they're giving you a platform. They're giving us a platform to sell, right? Otherwise, we would not have been able to do it as fast, you know, where we're getting a platform, uh, you know, the support of Uber or the other third parties. Uh, so it's important uh, to, you know, get into the spot sponsored listings or the BOGO as as Lola was saying. So, you know, those dollars have to be spent. You can make a successful ghost kitchen with not spending any money. Okay. But uh, I, I, just to jump in also uh, to her month, I don't know point, uh, Uber doesn't get the credit it deserves for all the support that they gave all the restaurants during COVID, all the marketing, reducing the fees, everything else. If it wasn't for them, I, I can guarantee you another 20, 25% of the industry would have been shut down. Having those third-party platforms really saved everybody. Right? No dining, no nothing, and you know, just basically Uber, and uh, you know, it, it was phenomenal. Right. And I'll, I'll of course second that, <laughs> but <laughs> it, you know, and, <laughs> and uh, well, of course, it's, it's true. Right? I'm not saying it because you're on the call. I'm saying it's the truth. I, I talked to everybody in the hospitality industry. And they all say if it wasn't for the platforms, you know, you guys know, you've done the studies and everything else. Exactly. And, you know, it's been a really tough year for, I think, everyone, especially the restaurant business. But I mean, I think what's been exciting for us is being able to be part of, you know, keeping restaurants going during this time. Like, as George mentioned, there's, you know, many concepts, restaurants, etc., that wouldn't have been able um, to make it through. Um, but again, part of that is like, you know, being top of mind, being able to connect with people who want your services, right? And at the end of the day, that's what we're trying to help restaurants do. All right, um, maybe we'll move on. Uh, George, a uh, question for you. How important is real estate and selecting a location uh, when you're developing a ghost kitchen? And, and what kind of things do you look for? Good question. Uh, for me, it's a little bit different than most because my, my goal from day one is to take over the market and have stores every four kilometers across North America. So it's really irrelevant. I need a store everywhere. But uh, people might be a little bit surprised by this, but my favorite markets are outside the GTA, in the rural, you know, little markets where they don't have options. Right? So when we go to uh, Collingwood or Woodstock, Ontario, or you know, small little towns, and we bring them the variety that we do, right? especially with the national brands. But even if you were just to do individual brands, you know, they don't have many options like you do in Toronto. So when you're in downtown Toronto, you know, you'll get 50 you know, uh, sandwich shops, 50 burger places, things. But when you go to the smaller markets, you only get, you know, three or four. And they close early and you don't have the options. And to touch on Lola's point uh, earlier, like we haven't scratched the surface of, you know, where this industry is headed and where it's going and the offerings that we can do, catering, uh, <laughs> gift baskets, flowers on Mother's Day, Valentine's Day, like it's endless, the potential that we have. But bringing, you know, product to consumers that they will never, not never, but normally wouldn't get is is the key for me. Okay. Does anybody have anything else they'd like to add on that topic? Real estate and site selection? All right, well, I've got a, another question for, for you, Hamant. Um, 
you know, uh, I, I guess as this delivery uh, trend has taken on, we've got a lot of restaurants that have filled it in, right, and and and, and worked out how to how to do uh, accommodate delivery into existing restaurants. But when you're designing a restaurant, what are you doing in the uh, new restaurant? What are you doing in the front of house areas, the back of house areas, to accommodate delivery? Um. Most restaurateurs like me, we think we can just use one fryer and do five concepts. I don't think so that works. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to go in for a lot more kitchen equipment. You need, it needs to be a, a bigger space, an open area. You know how Ghost Kitchen Brands is doing uh, now. You have to have a much bigger space now. You know, the investment is actually in the kitchen because it's the engine of the Ghost Kitchen there. Uh, you have to make sure the reason it was called dark kitchen before the ghost kitchens were called dark kitchens, but nobody could see a window before, you know, now, now the staff, they're having trouble. They, they, they don't want to work in dark spaces anymore. So you, you need to have a well lit kitchen. First of all, uh, it needs to be an open, uh, open, uh, air, I mean, open area. Uh, the other part is I think, uh, speed is so, so important because you're doing so many brands it's not easy to pull off just with four or five equipments out there, kitchen equipments. You need to have a lot more, you know, to be a lot more accurate in front of the house. The drivers are coming in. Somehow we all uh, restaurant guys think, oh, it's Uber, it's Uber, but they're part of our staff. They're delivering our food. We need to understand that part that, you know, the driver who's coming up, picking up our, our food is, is a part of our team. We need to get him out very quickly as soon as he walks in because we're wasting his time. So it has the speed, the accuracy, the efficiency, you know, the kitchen has to be modeled in such a way. The most important part for me is if you're doing, uh, if you're doing, let's say 10 different concepts, uh, then you have to match them where you're gonna create the stations properly and the sections in the kitchen uh, to make it much faster. Once you get that right, I think I think ghost kitchen concept for anyone is a winner. Otherwise, people will end up losing money. They waste a lot of food if the kitchen is not not done right. It's from from receiving the order to getting it out. You know, it it has to be really really efficient out there to make it successful. I think George can add a, a bit more out there because he's been the one who's facing the music in in the ghost kitchen more than me. George, well, you? yes, yeah, so, uh, you know, it's all about technology, right? Uh, especially on our end with 20 national brands in the kitchen, it's, it's all, you know, it's the thought of it, you know, operating 20 different brands in one kitchen at a 2000 square feet. If we didn't have the technology component on the, on the back end, it, it would be a nightmare. Uh, we've spent hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, acquiring a software company and developing our own technology on the back end to integrate with Uber and all the other third party platforms to streamline everything. Uh, automated kitchen equipment to, to expedite things to Payman's point. Uh, it's all about speed. Right? Uh, food's got to get in and out. It's QSR, five minutes. We don't bring any product online uh, in our kitchens that take more than five minutes to produce. So we can get the food in and out right away. Uber driver can come pick it up and get it to the customer yesterday and you know, ensure that the quality is there. Okay. One, one, one thing very important is uh, even, you know, like any restaurant, ghost kitchen, the supply, the suppliers are your, the, the brands which you're bringing in are your partners. You know, that's, that's so important because they need to come up with the menu to be able to, to really execute it well and, and fast there. Okay, um, you know, uh, I think uh, we had a great segue here because uh, George was mentioning technology. So maybe Lola, is there anything on the horizon with respect to new technology that will help operators efficiently operate ghost kitchens or delivery yeah. in general? Yeah, maybe I'll mention a couple of pieces and I think George said it very well. It's, it's all about technology. Um, it's all about technology, whether it's, you know, how you're managing your operations as your own you know, kitchen or dark kitchen or virtual brand or thinking about how you are working with and um, delivery partners um one big piece and again this is you know already something that exists and something that we work on with our larger partners is just pos integration so you know the having the ability not to have you know typically you know if you're a restaurant you're working with an app like ours they'll have a tablet that's ingesting orders to be able to bypass that, which is something that's absolutely crucial, 
if you're you know getting hundreds plus orders a day the ability to bypass that inject these order directly into your pos system um is huge right and that's the kind of investment that for restaurants who are serious in this space we would definitely definitely recommend um just from an efficiency standpoint from an accuracy reporting standpoint um etc um, but there's always new, um, yeah, I'd say technologies or, or, or pieces on the, the horizon. I'd say another um, interesting, um, uh, you know, aspect of technology that we're working with some of our partners on uh, is something that we call, you know, Uber Direct, which is like a white label delivery partner uh, or delivery product. You know, there are some brands who may not just want to be on Uber Eats or on another third party delivery platform, but have their own app, have their own very strong brand and are just looking for that last leg to help that get delivered. So that's a service that, you know, we provide as well. Um, but again, it's something, you know, quite exciting for folks who have a strong brand, have their own app or have their own website and are just looking for a, a, a company to provide that last leg of delivery. Um, so again, depending on, you know, there's so many models in this space, um, you know, there are so many sizes of operators, restaurants, et cetera. Um, but I think, you know, the technology has evolved quite a bit and will continue to evolve to be able to, to serve the needs of, uh, of lots of folks in this space. Okay. <clears throat> Um, we're getting um, getting uh, close to the end uh, of, of our our time. It's it's gone really fast, and uh, there's you've provided a lot of knowledge. I just uh, for those of you that are uh, watching, uh, any questions that you have, please put them in the chat. We'll be getting uh, to you shortly. Um, one question uh, that, that came up uh, in the registration was, uh, you know, what happens, how, how does it work when uh, customers are unsatisfied with the food? Um, how, 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 does, how does that, uh, you know, opportunity to, to do service recovery uh, go when you're we're dealing with a ghost kitchen? I'll just throw that out there to the panel to ask. Who wants to go first? Well, for us, it's a little bit tougher because Uber controls all that. So we don't have eyes on the consumer. Uh, so uh, the consumer would, uh, if they go through our app or it's one of our customers, we reach out instantly uh, and we you know, figure out what the issue was and compensate them, give, them, give certificates, send them another order, whatever it is. On Uber's behalf, I, I will let Lola take over. <laughs> yeah, and you know the 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 the, the answer is very very similar. So whether you're dealing with like you know a, you know a ghost kitchen or a virtual restaurant, um, the support experience is very similar. So for you know and you, you know things happen, right? You know there are tons of orders all the time. Folks are busy. We've got restaurants in the mix. We've got couriers in the mix. We've got eaters in the mix. You know, we're talking about people dealing with, you know, real things, right? So what we always encourage people to do is just, you know, contact us, buy a support in the application, right? There's always a, an easy way to ask for help. And then depending on what's happened, um, the next steps, you know, will be dealt with in accordance with our policies. You know, it may be that there's a refund or not, but we'll have teams that will, you know, in investigate what happened in a, in a particular circumstance. And if these two companies don't answer, they, they come directly to me. To Amaya. Amaya. <laughs> All right. Can I send them there? Can I send them there too? <laughs> All right. We have a, a question from the audience here. I'll throw it out to the group. Um, is anyone able to estimate the current industry worth in 2021? And where do you see the growth going over the next one to five years? It's a real tough one to start off with, but uh, anyone want to take a shot at that? That's for Lola. <laughs> yeah, I was just trying to unmute. That's a, that's a great question. I mean, nobody has a crystal ball, right? So, you know, I'm not going to you know say exactly what's the industry worth and what's it going to be worth in one to five, five years. Um, but broadly, um, what I'll say is that I think we are, you know, expecting continued um, growth and expansion. Like, I have no doubt um, that this space, whether it's restaurants overall, whether we're just talking about third party delivery, even when we're just talking about those kitchens, virtual kitchens in this space, um, no doubt that this is going to continue to grow uh, and evolve. Why? I think one, the consumer demand is there. Um, we are seeing the innovations, we are seeing the improvements in, uh, in technology. And I think at the end of the day, 
the demand is there. We have folks like Kamat and George who want to meet this demand. I, I see no reason why we would expect anything but to, you know, strong uh, continued growth. Okay, thank you. Uh, George, there's a question for you. Uh, can you please expand more on the five minutes you take to make a food item? Is that a minimum maximum time? Uh, and what are the ways that you achieve that five minutes? Is it uh, menu engineering? Is it technology combination? How do you do it? Well, it's a combination of everything, but the, the brands that we pick for our kitchens have to have a production of under five minutes. So a Quizmo subs takes a couple of minutes to make a Cinnabon. We bake them throughout the night, so we have them ready during the day. And the majority of the brand is their QSR. So just like walking into any you know, existing brick and mortar store, we, we produce everything the same way they do. So the majority of the brands that we bring on board are within that time span. Okay. We will not do fine dining. Yeah, okay, I hear. It. Not yet. Yeah. That's, that's Ghost Kitchen two. Ghost Kitchen brands number two. Coming soon. All right. Um, Lola, I think maybe you could kick this one off. Uh, another audience question. How do you deal with franchisees and markets if the Ghost Kitchen is separate? Ooh, can you repeat that? Um, how do you deal with franchisees and markets if it is separate, the ghost kitchen is separate from a okay. brick and mortar location? Okay, um, and maybe I'll take a, a start at this, and but you know, if other folks jump in if you, if, you, if I'm not getting the, the essence of the question. At the end of the day, like you know, there are different models in terms of how folks partner with Uber Eats. There, and you know, I'll speak you know broadly. In some cases, we work directly with like you know a corporate partner structure a deal with that corporate partner and then they then work directly with their franchisees we have some brands and in some regions where we actually partner directly with franchisees so it really depends on what's right for that corporate partner for that franchise partner and we are willing to work with anyone uh, to, to be honest so it really depends on you know um, uh, how the how the business is structured uh, and what they are looking to do in a particular market we're relatively flexible on that all right. Yeah. Maybe, maybe I, George. I don't think. Yeah, I don't think that's an Uber thing. That's more of a corporate head office thing for the franchisor. Where uh, myself, especially, we deal with nothing but franchises. So we have certain rights or certain restrictions if we're too close to a certain location in existing brick and mortar. Where they don't tell me not to do it, but you know, we find a, a way to make them happy to compensate them. Okay. Yeah, I was going to ask. So when you're going into a you know, one of the markets you mentioned was Collingwood. So uh, of the 20 brands, how many are in the market there? And um, is that why you have those brands? Or is it, it would, if, if you were putting a kitchen in a, a market where some of the brands exist, um, do you maybe leave one of your 20 out or a couple of your 20 out? Or how, how does, well, how do you, how do you yeah. put A hundred percent. So we actually have 60, 70 brands in our portfolio. So we have the option to switch brands in and out. So if there's, there is any conflict with one certain brand, we can take it out and replace it with something else. But to your point about Collingwood, that's exactly why I love Collingwood, because we're bringing them cinema and Cheesecake Factory and Quiznos and so on and so on, which you know they will never get the opportunity to try. Okay. I got another question uh, from the audience that we'll throw it to the group here. Uh, what is the 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 good, the positive negatives of the different uh, models? And in a, a follow up question to that is: Is it better to be a landlord or better to be a licensee? Maybe uh... always good to be a landlord. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Did, can you expand on that, Amit? No, I mean, uh, what I what I think is, uh, uh, you know, it's it's. There are different models of doing it, right? And and yes, you know, you can be a landlord or a licensee at at in your own building or the otherwise. Uh, did I get the question right? I mean, have I got it right? Or... Yeah, well, I, I guess uh, you know, I, I I'm well, interpreting this question as, you know, are, are you better to uh, um, uh, be something that's got a ghost kitchen and you're renting out space to, to other people or uh you know uh, george's model um you know i i guess the the different models what what are the positive and negatives of those that we haven't touched on already earlier in the session well being a landlord is always good so let's let's get that out 
uh, the different different models. Uh, I think where the ghost kitchen brands right now is moving. I, I I do think that's that's what what has got legs now. You you need to be in a high demand area. Have to have a little, basically it, it's becoming a very small food court also, right? So it is it is a better model to do it like that than the other cloud kitchens or or revolving kitchens. Uh, I think this model works better. Okay. Yeah, Anyone yeah, else? else jump in? Right? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So um, I'm not a big believer in the in the renting of the kitchens. I, I really believe that if you have a brick and mortar store or you know physical the location where you're actually having your dining and everything else and you add to that with a virtual brand that makes sense but virtual brands only in a rental kitchen are very tough because you need the volume and when you're in those locations you got you know some of these kitchens have 20 30 40 kitchens that they're renting out and everyone's running three four virtual brands the amount of competition the amount of revenue that you need to make and with the delivery fee only you know uh, revenue sources from delivery plus the fees that you pay the platforms and everything else it's very hard to to make it profitable if you don't have that base of walking component it's going to be very very hard okay anyone else have uh, anything to add on uh, positive or negative of the different models one, one of the things george that you said uh, segues nicely into this next question um virtual brands uh in the states are actively growing um, what's the future for virtual brands in Canada? What do we see there? And I'll just throw that out to the floor, see who wants to, to take that one. Uh, we're launching our first big virtual brand in a couple of weeks, uh, Mr. Beast Burger. You know, we just brought it up in the United States. And I believe it's got legs. Um, I just don't know if it's a fad or if it's gonna be there long term. And can't tell you that for another probably six months. Uh, there's a lot of brands that were created over the last year because of COVID and a lot of people jumped into this space. Uh, but again, for me, it, it, it comes down to, you can make the brand work, it's just execution. Right? With us, it, it's a lot easier because I manage and own and control all the locations across Canada, so we can ensure quality. Right? But when you're, you're licensing out virtual brands to independents, it's going to be very hard for them to stay on top of the quality and the, the customer experience. But some of them will, will have longevity. Okay. Uh, Lola Hermant, did anything to jump in on the future of virtual brands in Canada? Um, I think, you know, building on what George said, I think we'll continue to see more, which is exciting. Um, but I think we'll probably see a bit more just like testing and learning. Again, if, if there's less focus on actually building a restaurant that is going to be the home for this concept, or this brand, I think there's a little bit more freedom for, for example, let's launch this virtual brand, see if we get the traction, see if this makes sense. If it doesn't, you know, there's a bit less risk involved in pivoting. So I also do see that we're, you know, we're gonna see things come, folks will test, try it. Okay, this one didn't work, let's try another one. And so I think we're gonna see a bit more, uh, I don't know, I'd say like multitude or kind of, you know, creativity and experimentation in the space over, over the coming years. I think so most exciting. chefs are jumping into it in Toronto, who uh, owned a higher end fine dining upmarket restaurants. Uh, they all are jumping into these. So we will see uh, a huge, huge jump in, in this. You know, uh, in States, uh, uh, you know, they're, they're a little bit ahead of us in what we're getting into now. Uh, we will see a big change uh, in the next six months to a year. We will see, you know, how once things start coming back. A lot of chefs I've spoken to in the city are now uh, really looking into into doing these things. Okay. Well, that you know, with that, and, and I can't believe how quickly our time's gone. I, I would just uh, before I uh, wrap things up, I'd like to thank the the three of you for uh, sharing some great information today. It's certainly um, an exciting uh, way. I'm sure if we talked ten years ago uh about this topic uh people would have looked at us like we we're crazy and now it's uh one of the the you know major uh growth segments in in canada so uh thanks so much for uh sharing your knowledge and with that i'm going to pass it back to dimitri to wrap things up thanks thank again you. everyone thank you thank you
Thanks, Jeff. Uh, and thank you to all our panelists today. Appreciate the, uh, the commentary and feedback. Uh, definitely interesting stuff. Uh, so I'll make it quick here. Before we close out uh, this session, just a quick reminder uh, to everyone that the Innovations and Restaurant Development session is taking place at 2 p.m., so in about 15 minutes uh, Eastern. So I'll see you over in that session uh, shortly. Uh, and uh, a final reminder to check out the sponsors and partner profiles in the exhibit hall, as well as connect with some other fellow attendees in the networking area. Uh, so again, thank you, Jeff, George, Lola, Hamant, for joining us today and sharing your viewpoints. Uh, thank you to all our sponsors and thank you our audience for joining us. Take care.